Hey folks, if you only watch one video of mine, let this be the one. This is the most important writing advice I can give. So listen close. Watch this clip of a joke from this movie. This is not a non sequitur, bear with me. Boulder was hungry. Classic joke. You've seen it a million times. Wacky character cameo. Wacky character does something insane. Relatable character is visibly incredulous. It's basically a ton of the jokes from The Office. Michael does something crazy. Jim looks into the camera. But that is not where this clip ends. Let's watch on. I still can't get over the fact that she's related to Pinkie Pie. Did you feel the moment that joke died? The moment all that funny potential vanished into the ether like steam on a cloudy sky? Of course you did. It's like if in the office, when Michael does something zany, Zim first looked into the camera, but then said, get a load of this guy. I mean, Christ, if I was watching on TV, I'd change the channel. That was overwriting. That was a character packing too much into a scene, too worried that the joke wouldn't land, that they accidentally smothered it before it reached the screen. It doesn't just happen to jokes, every facet of writing is at risk. I'm going to teach you how to avoid it. I'm going to teach you to economize your story. So what does that even mean? What does it mean to economize a story? Well, it's a concept I've borrowed from my study of poetry at university. When writing a poem, you have very little space to work with. For my assignments in particular, we were allowed poems of 11 to 40 lines, but my lecturer said that it was sometimes permissible to write a poem shorter than that if it served the poem. And served the poem is correct. That pressure to economize, to shrink the poem into the smallest pocket of rich, dense writing you can, means it achieves the maximum effect with the smallest number of words. This, by the way, is why haikus are very difficult form when done correctly. Imagine trying to cram a paragraph's worth of meaning into just 17 syllables. Now that's skill. Not even I could manage that, and I am very good. Now, obviously, you don't want your prose to be that dense. In fact, there are many ways in which you don't want your prose to be poem-like, and often in workshops I could tell where someone was writing too much like poetry because their prose would be somewhat disjointed, because in a poem you don't have to actually follow the rules of grammar as much as in prose, etc, etc. However, I feel that taking after this aspect of poetry in a small way, focusing on removing redundancy and tightening things up, can really help improve the flow and impact of a piece. Let's start with an axiom. You may have heard of the famous, perhaps infamous maxim, show don't tell, for which there is more nuance than is usually suggested by the phrase. Allow me to add to it with a new axiom that similarly contains nuance but is generally useful to treat as true. Don't tell what you've already shown. This generally means try not to repeat yourself. I can understand the want to make things extra clear to your reader, to repeat an idea, to really make sure your reader gets it, but I'm afraid you've got to take a step back and trust the reader to just understand you. Writing is a collaborative process between writer and reader because they are forming the image in their mind. You cannot perform that effectively without trust. When you repeat ideas to try and make sure they stick, then often what you do is weaken the impact the first time you said it. That's not to say repetition has no place in prose, in fact it's a classic rhetorical trick for a reason, but that you should keep an eye out for places where your attempts to clarify your meaning are actually weakening impact. I suggest you remove them to make your dialogue snappier and sharper. What of dialogue? Well, there's places here you can remove things too. Generally, conversation fiction happen for a reason. There's usually information to communicate, either from character to character or from you to your reader. Therefore, I recommend you remove small talk or anything that reduces the effectiveness of that dialogue. Not to the point of removing character from that dialogue, obviously, because that would actually weaken the dialogue. But to the point that your lines feel natural while perfectly serving their communicative purpose. In fact, this is generally why characters in fiction don't talk the way we do in real life. A lot of what is removed is little things that are forgettable in human speech, but in written word would weaken the effect of the conversation. I'm actually planning on making a video about advice for dialogue, so subscribe if you want to see that when it comes out. 
Word choices are another place you can economize. Now, I'm sure you've heard from teachers back in school not to use words said and instead use different words. Now, any writer worth their salt will tell you that this is bullshit. And let me be frank, this is just a tactic teachers use to help teach you a larger vocabulary. It's respectable, but quality writing it is not. However, there is a slight truth to this premise when it comes to other verbs, which is you can often find a verb that can replace a verb-adverb pairing and thereby make your prose more precise and flow smoother. For example, you could replace the statement, he strolled leisurely, with he sauntered, which flows nicer and if you ask me, is just a fun word to say. Saunter. Crowley had it right with that one, gotta tell ya. Another place you can clean up is removing adverbs or other parts of a phrase that are already implied by another word in that phrase. For example, phrases like she shouted loudly or they fell down are weakened because shouted implies loud and they fell implies a downward motion. This kind of repetition is called tautology and it generally weakens whatever you were trying to say. This kind of inefficiency is why a lot of writers will tell you to reduce adverb and adjective use, but I think there's uh, some nuance there. An adverb or adjective can be quite useful when referring to an unexpected trait, like if a person fell upwards, we'd be quite intrigued, would we not? One of the reasons why this is so important is pacing. When your writing is cluttered up with redundancies, it can make your description and writing really dense, which makes it really slow to read. This means that your pacing will be slower than you want it to be, which prevents your story from reaching its full potential. If you feel like your writing is slower than you want it to be, but don't really want to cut anything important, look for places like I've mentioned here that you can economize your writing, be precise in your wording, remove repetition and unnecessary details. This, of course, is what editing is for. It's totally okay if your first draft is full of repetition. You can go back and remove it in editing. They say writing is rewriting for a reason. You want to focus on making your writing effective and giving the right amount of weight to all the parts you want to have weight. A lot of how we write is about applying the right amount of weight to different lines and areas. It's why, for example, we might isolate a sentence to its own paragraph and simplify it to give it extra weight and power it wouldn't have if it was the start or the end of another paragraph, or if it was more long-winded. We might also employ the use of Fonus themes, but that's a talk for another day. Economizing writing is very much in the same vein. You're just trying to make sure that the right parts of your writing have the strength that you know they deserve. And that's that. Make sure to subscribe if you want to order this content on your feed, hit the notification bell if you actually use that feature and want to be notified, and know that new videos from now on will come out a week early on Patreon. Link in the description. I hope you enjoyed and thank you all so much for watching.